Welcome to, well, probably the longest and most comprehensive video I've done yet. This is going to be the most ambitious project on the channel so far. We're going to look into the full timeline of this epic series of games, which includes Outlast 1, Whistleblower, Outlast 2, and we are going to fill in the gaps by looking at the Murkoff Account Comics 2. I will begin this plot as one long piece encompassing the entire video, but there will be chapters indicating when we've broken from the plot to discuss certain characters. I feel this is the best model for explaining a game series in such detail. Strap in, grab a drink, and let's crack on and do this. Wayland Park, a married man with two kids, who is a freelance software consultant, sits in an empty server room located in an underground facility beneath the Mount Massive Asylum for the criminally insane, and he seems very nervous. He is actually in the process of sending a whistleblowing email to an investigative journalist named Miles Upshur. Whalen is concerned that his employers, the transnational company named the Murkoff Corporation, are involved in illegal and inhumane activities. He has overheard doctors talking about dream therapy going too deep. Whalen tells Miles that this needs to be exposed. Whalen's job was to maintain Murkoff's magnum opus creation called the Morphogenic Engine. This engine allowed patients to enter lengthy and very lucid dream states. An entity would come to be birthed out of this machine, an entity called the Wall Rider. This is what the experiments are centered around and their research is aptly named Project Wall Rider. The Wall Rider is essentially a swarm of tiny nanomachines controlled by a subject who are themselves under the control of the Morphogenic Engine. A note here states that the Wall Rider itself is also referred to as Alp. Mara or Shrat, a demonic creature of German origin. Some researchers believe there was a supernatural element behind the Wall Rider, and that it was a manifestation of this creature. Anyway, back into the story. Whalen is interrupted, as he is needed at the Morphogenic Engine. He is just about manages to hit send on the email and makes his way to control room. Whalen, after fixing one of the cameras in the pod, the pod which holds the subject, is startled by an inmate named Eddie Gluskin. Gluskin is being put into the morphogenic engine so Murkoff can see if he is compatible, and therefore able to control the wall rider through his dream state. If he's not compatible, then he will suffer disfigurement and lesions. Such is the brutal nature of the engine. We can see that Gluskin isn't compatible as these lesions and scarring start to show up straight away. Whalen makes his way back to the server room and waiting for him is Jeremy Blair. He's Whalen's boss and is the VP for global development at Murkoff. He also runs Mount Massive Asylum, and in addition to that, he oversees Project War Rider 2. Blair has found Whalen's email and has several security guards attack Whalen and detain him as an inmate of Mount Massive Asylum. He makes up an elaborate lie stating that Whalen resigned due to mental illness. But why were they so concerned so as to go to the trouble of doing this? You see, Murkoff have a long detailed history of criminal, unethical, and immoral practices. Here's a short history. In 1938, Murkoff were exposed for selling diphosphine gas to German forces. This was for the German forces to use it as a poison gas in artillery shells during World War I. This gas was so potent that it would destroy regular gas mask filters. Murkoff also had a hand in conducting group experiments for the CIA program named MKUltra, a top secret mind control experiment which focused on using drugs and other procedures for the end goal of mind control and interrogation purposes. These experiments were being carried out at Mount Massive, uh, amongst other places. Murkoff would put unwilling individuals through trials of sorts during the Cold War, but in the late 60s, Mount Massive was shut down due to some scientists being murdered by an inmate. A few years later, under the orders of CIA Director Richard Helms, all MKUltra files are destroyed, basically burying Murkoff's involvement in MKUltra. And then years later in 2009, Mount Massive was reopened under the guise of a charitable organisation named Murkoff Psychiatric Care, and over the next few years Murkoff continued their experiments in secret, and with a steady stream of inmates at their disposal, Murkoff stood to rake in great profits. This leads us back to the present day. Whelan comes round later on, and he is being subjected to morphogenic therapy, a form of psychological torture. The man subjecting him to the torture is called away as it's revealed that an inmate named Billy Hope has managed what is referred to as lateral ascension with the project. Basically, it means that he's compatible with the engine and is able to control the wall rider, which in turn 
has a significant impact on what comes next. Waylon gets free from his restraints and sees the Wall Rider attacking inmates. The entire facility shuts down and all hell breaks loose due to the Wall Rider breaking loose. Picking up a camcorder with the aim of capturing everything on film in order to try and take down Murkoff, Waylon escapes his cell. However, it is not long before he comes face to face with the Wall Rider himself, who tries to attack him, but Waylon escapes and runs into a number of deformed inmates. These inmates with significant deformities are called variants. They're the ones who have been subjected to the effects of the morphogenic engine, but were basically incompatible. Reject, if you like. He overhears a guard and an employee talking about a radio in the prison, which will allow them to call for help. Waylon decides that he needs to get to that radio. As Waylon continues on, he finds that some variants are calm and just want to be left alone, but some are hostile towards him. Very hostile and extremely disturbed. Which brings us on to Frank Maniera. Frank is a cannibal. A wiry man, he is described as having lost 73 pounds in weight after he was subjected to the morphogenic engine. Nothing is really known about his background, but I'm guessing it has something to do with his cannibalistic quirks. Anyway, Waylon walks through a kitchen and is shocked to witness Frank having his dinner, so to speak, and after sneaking around him and also after a chase, Waylon gets to relative safety, but this is only for a moment as Frank bursts through the door. He shoves Waylon into a furnace, but again, Waylon manages to get free, eventually escaping and seeing the back of Frank for good. However, Waylon has to get through a foggy courtyard. Waylon is forced to find an alternate way into a building after encountering a couple of inmates known only as the Twins. Waylon eventually makes it to the radio, but he is ambushed by Jeremy Blair, who proceeds to smash up the radio and attacks Waylon. Out of nowhere, a terrifying growl belonging to a huge variant inmate named Chris Walker. <laughs> Let's pause really quick and talk about Chris Walker and how he ended up at Mount Massive. Years ago, Chris started out his career as a military policeman in the US Army. He toured Afghanistan, but like many military personnel on those tours, he developed PTSD. Upon his return home to the United States, he was committed to Spindle Top Psychotherapy Clinic in Hatton, Texas. The clinic was owned by none other than the Murkoff Corporation as part of their Research Through Charity initiative. He was subjected to therapy by a Dr. Claymore, who used Arabic culture in his therapy in order for them to try and overcome their trauma. This backfired, as they all seemed to suffer delusions of an Arcadian demigod named Apkalu. The problem is, the therapy these veterans were subjected to actually had a negative effect in that their psychological wounds would close at first, but then they would reopen even wider. Chris was one of the ones subjected to this therapy. Either way, Chris would get better, and start working for Murkoff as a surveillance officer, overlooking therapy sessions. Due to his size and strength, he was nicknamed Strong Fat by colleagues, a nickname which he didn't really like at all. At some point, Chris witnessed inmates in a trance during a therapy session, and they mentioned Ap Kalu, and something triggered inside Chris, and he snapped, killing three inmates. But he didn't just kill them, he literally tore them limb from limb. Due to Murkoff owning the clinic and not wanting the authorities to know what happened, they sent their litigation, or their, rather their legal team, to speak with Dr. Claymore, a pair of Murkoff litigation agents named Paul Marion and Pauline Glick, aptly nicknamed the Pauls. They tried to speak to Claymore, but he, as he wasn't working directly for Murkoff, he wouldn't really give them any information. Looking for a way around it, they question Chris, assuming him to just be an employee, and he misleads them. What the Pauls don't know, though, is that after their meeting with Dr. Claymore, Chris ends up murdering Dr. Claymore too, then he destroyed the CCTV equipment and fled. Realising that Chris is responsible for the murders, the Pauls went to Chris's home. The Pauls found the victims' heads in boxes, and these murders were dubbed the Hatbox Murders. They find a stuffed animal from his childhood, a pig. Chris arrived carrying the head of Dr. Claymore in a box and saw the agents holding his stuffed animal. He went crazy and a fight broke out. Chris was shot in the face by Pauline, but even that didn't stop him. He threw Pauline out of the window. In the end, she had to take him down by driving straight at him in her car, finally knocking him out. Careful not to draw blame, as Chris was a Murkoff employee, they deflected it and pinned the blame on another patient named Omar Abdul Malik. Due to them trying to cover up what happened with Chris Walker, they committed him to Mount Massive and experimented on him. Now, due to the state of his mind, Chris tore the skin from his forehead. This was due to the belief that he had a third eye, which would help him see things more clearly. He also tore the skin from his lips and his nose due to having developed a hatred for the damage the morphogenic engine experiments had done to his face. He would be restrained in response to the self-harming, which explains why he has chains on his wrists. 
Anyway, that is the backstory of Chris Walker, so let's get back into the story. Chris chases Waylon into a tool shed, but on the way, Waylon sees a man known as Father Martin Archimbold painting a message onto the wall in blood. Father is said in quotation marks as he isn't a real priest. Father Martin, likely in his 60s, is an inmate of Mount Massive Asylum who suffers from dementia, delusions, and schizoaffective disorder. His symptoms ease when participating in the asylum's art therapy program, or more specifically, finger painting. His therapist, Dr. Neil Wolfram, said that he had made great strides, but he was dismayed to find out that Murkoff were pulling the program. As Dr. Wolfram expected and feared, Archimbord's symptoms worsened and he regressed, suffering from delusions of a higher calling. Basically, he worshipped the wall rider and he saw himself as a prophet of sorts. Waylon moves on and ends up in the vocational block and after evading yet more variants, Waylon comes face to face with Eddie Gluskin, the test subject from before. He is now noticeably scarred from the effects of the morphogenic engine. Waylon jumps down an elevator shaft while escaping Gluskin and hurts his leg. The previous variant referenced Gluskin as the groom and we are about to find out why. Gluskin mutilates male inmates, removing their, you know, parts and tries to make them into a bride before killing them. Gluskin's backstory, although slightly vague in its detail, is actually kind of sad. He was abused by his father and uncle as a kid who would take pictures of the abuse. Apparently Gluskin didn't know it was wrong, but only knew that it hurt him. This unresolved trauma led to Gluskin becoming a serial killer who targeted women, who was eventually incarcerated in Mount Massive Asylum. Anyway, Gluskin captures Waylon after he tried to hide in a locker and drags him to his workshop and sprays a substance into the locker, making him pass out. After receiving Waylon Park's whistleblowing email, Miles Upshur now arrives at Mount Massive Asylum with his camcorder in hand, ready to capture evidence of what is going on there. Miles is already aware of the history of Mount Massive and the controversies surrounding the Murkoff Corporation. You see, from looking at the beta version of the whistleblower email in an unused cutscene, Miles was an investigative reporter who got fired from his previous job for posting sensitive information about the Afghanistan conflict. Since then, Miles has been freelance and self employed. Miles enters the asylum through a window. Given that the riot and the variant uprising happened only a few hours earlier, the place is a mess. Miles finds the leader of a security team that called Murkoff Hardline Security impaled on a pike. He has just enough breath to attempt to get out as the variants have escaped. Miles meets Chris Walker, who throws him out of a window, making him pass out. Interestingly, Chris repeats the same phrase as when he saw the Pauls holding his toy. Little pig. Miles comes to and Father Martin is standing over him and calls Miles an apostle. Father Martin has locked the main doors for the exit, but Father Martin has turned off the power, meaning that Miles has to go down to the basement and turn it back on again. He makes it back to the control room, but Father Martin injects him with a sedative. Turning Miles' attention to the monitors, Father Martin tells him that he has so much yet to witness and makes him watch the war rider going ham and tearing into and decimating an entire squad of Murkov hardline security staff. Miles passes out once again and Father Martin puts him in a padded cell somewhere deep in the asylum. This is actually Father Martin's own cell, indicated by the rest in peace and crosses written on the walls. Miles meets the unmistakable twins, the cannibals who briefly discuss which part of Miles they want to eat first, until they reveal that Father Martin has asked them not to touch him. It seems that Father Martin has a lot of influence over the variants. Miles escapes the cell block and after more meetings with Chris Walker in the sewers, he manages to make it to the male ward where he's chased by some inmates. A friendly voice tells him to get into the dumb waiter, but well, Miles discovers that this person isn't really very friendly at all. Meet Dr. Richard Traeger. Way back when, Dr. Richard Traeger was a Murkoff executive. He was a well-dressed man with medium length hair, but how did he end up as what seems to be a heavily scarred inmate and what's more, a failed experiment of the morphogenic engine? Well, Traeger was the head of business development at the asylum. He was good friends with Jeremy Blair, indicated by this note which states that they played golf together. Traeger at some point sexually assaulted another Murkoff employee named Michelle Haas, and Michelle became pregnant. She complained anonymously to the HR department about it, and along came the hotshot litigation duo Pauline Glick and Paul Marion. They go and speak to Traeger to find out which department the allegations came from, and he naturally puts on a front, smiling, joking around with them, and telling them they should be on Team Rick. He debunks the claims and insists they didn't come from his department. Marion thinks he's dirty, so Glick arranges to meet him for a dinner. When back at his house, Traeger offers Glick a line of cocaine, which she refuses. Traeger then proceeds to spike her drink with Rohypnol, but she notices and she forces him to drink it, 
making him pass out. The Pauls eventually confront Michelle Haas about the assault, and she confesses to them that Traeger did it and got her pregnant. Traeger then forced her to either get an abortion or he would fire her. Paul Marion prepared a severance package in true litigation style. In exchange, Michelle would stay silent about it. Michelle took the deal, but Traeger stormed into the room. Grabbing scissors, he stabbed Michelle in the stomach multiple times. Don't worry, Michelle wasn't actually pregnant, but we'll get to that later on in the video. Glick grabbed Traeger by the neck and his hair got trapped in a paper shredder, tearing off part of his scalp, which is why he looks like an aged monk. Traeger was taken as an inmate of the asylum and used as a test subject for the engine. Jeremy Blair, despite being Traeger's friend, seemed to really enjoy this. So Traeger became a surgeon during the incident, sadistically cutting up staff members and operating on people. This extends to Miles as he hits him, disorienting him and proceeds to wheel him to a room where he talks of how much he dislikes Father Martin. Traeger cuts off Mars' fingers and leaves the room. Mars regains his compulsion and his fingers and manages to sneak around Traeger and grab a key for the elevator and make himself some Traeger juice. Miles sees the exit. Freedom. Well, not really. Miles has to cross the pitch black courtyard and comes face to face with the Wall Rider, which bizarrely chooses not to attack him. It's not long before Miles is chased by Chris Walker again, but he manages to make it to the female ward. And after losing his video camera after a fall, Miles goes to retrieve it and manages to make it to the upper floors. He enters a sort of movie theatre which plays an exit interview for Dr. Rudolf Wernicke, the madman behind the morphogenic engine. He states in this interview that the engine attaches to insanity, that only someone who has witnessed enough horror and torment is capable of activating the engine. The interviewer asks if there's an element of the supernatural behind the wolf rider and Wernicke replies that there is not. Dr. Wernicke dies shortly after this interview, apparently. His death certificate is here. The truth of the matter, however, is that Dr. Wernicke is very much alive, but hang tight, we'll discuss him shortly. Mars gets to the chapel and sees Father Martin has set himself on fire on a cross, such as his commitment and dedication to the wall rider. Miles takes an elevator down to the depths of the asylum where he discovers a series of tunnels. It's clear that the wall rider has had a pretty good time down here as Miles finds corpses everywhere. He eventually gets chased by the wall rider himself, but runs straight into Chris Walker, whose life is prematurely ended by the wall rider who slams him straight into a steel grate. A door is opened and inside a sealed off room sits a fragile and very old Dr. Wernicke. Right, so as promised, let's discuss Wernicke. Dr. Rudolf Wernicke was born in Germany in 1918. He collaborated with Alan Turing on a paper and this brought Wernicke great success and renown in the scientific community. He helped Nazi Germany at some point during the war effort, but he was brought to the US under Operation Paperclip, an operation which would see prominent German or Austrian scientists, or skilled people in general, come to the US in an attempt to take those assets away from potential enemies. He worked in Los Alamos, which as we know, is where lots of government work took place. Truth of the matter is that Wernicke was likely carrying out research as part of MK Ultra, conducting mind control experiments on subjects during the Cold War. This is where I believe the Outlast trials were conducted, but we'll find out more about that when the next game finally releases. He went on to retire and spend his time in New Mexico, where he pursued photography. He wasn't married and didn't have children and eventually came out of retirement and chose to pursue charitable work for Murkoff at Mount Massive Asylum. But this was all a guise for Wernicke to install his morphogenic engine in the bowels of the asylum and subject the inmates of Mount Massive to horrific experiments. To keep his involvement secret and confine him to the asylum to continue his work, Wernicke was pronounced dead and the death certificate was fabricated by Murkoff. He was brought in in order to study human nanotechnology. Wernicke and his team managed to eventually produce specific molecules in order to create the entity known as the Wall Rider. Wernicke mentions to Miles that a patient named Billy Hope was what's known as a lucid dreamer, where he is able to control what happens in his dream state. That, coupled with the horrors, trauma and madness he's experienced in his life, made him a perfect fit for the engine. Billy was able to control the Wall Rider. Billy, in some sick, twisted way, views Wernicke as his father and chooses to keep Wernicke alive. But Wernicke mentions his regret and that they were foolish to think they could master such a powerful creation. He insists that Billy must die and instructs Miles to turn off his life support as this will destroy the Wall Rider. Miles eventually sees Billy, all hooked up to the machine, basically dead, hanging on by a thread, only being kept alive by the engine. Miles turns off the life support but is viciously attacked by the Wall Rider, which doesn't fully kill him. Miles hobbles out with his video evidence of what went on but is greeted by a squad of Murkoff's security forces and Wernicke. 
Thinking that the Wall Rider is now dead and likely seeing the camera in his hand and knowing that Miles is a witness to the atrocities of the asylum, Miles is gunned down. He is killed. But in one twist in the tale, Wernicke realises that Miles has been possessed by the Wall Rider and Miles attacks and mauls the security team, killing them all, presumably killing Wernicke too. You have become a host. In the meantime, Waylon wakes up from his slumber and finds Gluskin, well, doing Gluskin things. He is saved by an inmate at the nick of time and attempts to get out using a key. He can't move very fast due to his injured leg and Gluskin inevitably catches up to him, attempting to hang him up in the rafters just like the countless other victims. But this backfires, Gluskin loses control of the rope and gets impaled on a spike. Good riddance. Waylon makes his way to the exit and sees the burning chapel in the background and the very dead Traeger by the elevators. He sees none other than Jeremy Blair waiting by the door, heavily injured but with just enough strength to stab Waylon in the stomach. Wall Rider Miles shows up however like the hero he is and literally tears Jeremy to shreds. Also good riddance. Waylon makes it to Miles' jeep and sees Miles' body engulfed by the nano swarm of the Wall Rider, which bizarrely seems to help Waylon by pushing the jeep through the gates. Obviously there's still some part of Miles in there that wants the truth to get out. Waylon eventually meets up with a man named Simon Peacock, an ex Murkoff employee who Murkoff consider dangerous as he himself leaked sensitive material from the company. Peacock was also experimented on at Murkoff and as a result developed some supernatural abilities of his own. He founded the site Viraleaks, he's kind of a nod to Julian Assange, where Waylon will be uploading all the evidence to. Peacock tells Waylon that if he uploads the file containing the evidence, he will be running from Murkoff for the rest of his life. Waylon uploads the file anyway. Simon dies at some point, but not completely. We'll find out more later on. In the aftermath, the pools arrive at Mount Massive to assess the damage and the cleanup job needed in order to stop this getting out. The pools walk in and see pieces of Jeremy Blair everywhere. Paul Marion finds that all the video drives were wiped, likely by Jeremy Blair. Pauline Glick seems to be happy about this as it means, as she puts it, an easier cleanup. Now this is where it gets slightly crazy. Whilst they are investigating the discovery of Miles' Jeep, the Pauls get a report of Miles Upshur's bank account being accessed from a cell tower 80 miles from Mount Massive. This report would lead them to the most sensitive patient at Mount Massive Asylum, 80 miles away from there. It's Billy Hope. You see, even though Billy was killed by Miles, the Wall Rider still possessed some part of Billy within it. Billy went home to see his mother Tiffany. The Wall Rider, being a collection of nanites, allowed Billy to appear to his mother as human in some way. Naturally, the Pauls arrive not long afterwards and question Tiffany. They ask her if she knows Miles Upshur, but she says she doesn't. Pauline makes mentions of the fact that Tiffany never once visited her son at Mount Massive and she replies that it wasn't allowed, that it would be bad for his treatment. The truth is actually a lot worse. You see, a note in the game states that Murkoff gave Tiffany a substantial amount of money. Essentially, she sold her son to Murkoff and Murkoff told Billy that his mother had a heart attack. Anyway, the Pauls ask her how she got the money to buy some Swarovski figurines and she kicks them out. Paul Marion looks back and sees something on top of the trailer but can't make it out and they leave but they leave a Murkoff officer there to stake out Tiffany's home. Whilst the agent was staking out the place, the Pauls decided to go on the offensive. They smeared Wayland Park's name. They essentially painted him as a weirdo, a conspiracy theorist, and someone who was perverted, racist, and delusional. Pauline receives a call from the agent. It seems that Tiffany's boyfriend has arrived at the trailer. He accuses her of seeing another man, and after an argument, he hits her and goes back to his car. He drives away, but is torn apart by Billy the Wall Rider. Seeing a crash, the agent goes to check it out and, well, it doesn't really go well for him either. He tells Pauline it's the Wall Rider and gets absolutely decimated. Billy appears to his mother and smashes all of her expensive statues, telling her he will take care of her. Murkoff then pulled out all the stops in order to contain the Wall Rider. The Pauls approach Tiffany. Turns out the story of Billy Hope is even worse than imagined. Pauline reveals that Billy Hope was never mentally ill. He was just a lucid dreamer. She sold her son to Murkoff so she could buy a few crystal figurines. Out of nowhere, Billy tears his mother to shreds knowing this and the Pauls escape the trailer. They think they've killed it, but it turns out that the Wall Rider has now just possessed a colony of ants. It's basically switched hosts. 
With that seemingly settled, the Pauls go on to investigate the residents of Wayland Park. To the Pauls' abject disappointment, the house had been burnt down. Paul Marion sees a homeless man there, but thinks absolutely nothing of it. Afterwards, they arrive in DC at Mars Upshur's residence. Bizarrely, his neighbour says that she saw him there the night before. But she says it's weird as her dogs wouldn't stop barking at him and they usually love him. They both note that the place is swarming with none other than ants. Both of the Pauls strip off outside to get rid of the ants, but Paul Marion spots the same homeless man from in Colorado and chases him. The man turns around and it's none other than Simon Peacock. He asks Paul Marion what his name is, but he doesn't give it to him. Peacock tells Marion that he seems to have something other Murkoff employees don't. Shame. Marion knows what he's doing is wrong. The only thing is, he has no choice. Let's discover why. You see, Paul Marion lost his wife to an illness, and his 15-year-old daughter Alice has that same illness. Marion took a job with Murkoff because they have an experimental treatment for this rare disease. You see, Alice needs gene therapy transfusions, which, under Marion's Murkoff employee benefits, will save him $65,000 in medical bills, leaving him with only $3,000 to pay himself. Anyways, Peacock tells Marion that Mount Massive was just a pebble in a pond, an experiment on individuals. He points to some coordinates and tells him that is where the real sickness spreads. He tells Marion that he needs some body inside Murkoff to help him. Peacock shoves a block of styrofoam into Marion's mouth and takes an impression of his teeth so he can find out his identity. Glick turns up and shoots Peacock multiple times, but strangely, it doesn't affect him. Remember I mentioned there was something supernatural about Simon Peacock? Well, here it is. Simon Peacock is dead. Likely sometime after the Whalen Park leak, but we don't know how or when. Peacock gets away and the Pauls have Miles' house fumigated to kill the ants. But all that's left is black powder, and no evidence that could lead them to Peacock, Park, or Miles Upshur. The trail was dead, the ants had basically chewed everything to mush. Glick seems happy though, nothing can trace anything back to Mount Massive. Marion shows Glick the coordinates Peacock gave him, but she says to leave it. The coordinates themselves lead to the Harasupai Reservation, 80 miles northwest of Flagstaff in Arizona. Near to those coordinates, a young pregnant woman and a man seem to be running away from something. The man states that every step they take, the less power he has got. Back at Paul Marion's house, Alice sees a man messing with the mailbox. It's Simon Peacock. Marion confronts him, but he runs off. Peacock left the same coordinates again, but this time, stated that Alice, his daughter, is connected somehow. Marion flies to Arizona despite Glick telling him not to. He rents an SUV and drives out to the coordinates and all of a sudden a bright light appears along with a deafening sound and Marion is somehow back in hospital the night his wife died. All of a sudden he snaps out of whatever trance he was in as he has been attacked by the man and woman who were escaping before. A fight breaks out and the man stabs Marion in the arm so Marion kills the guy and the pregnant girl runs off. Marion keeps seeing visions of his dead wife but is eventually picked up by a family who take him to the hospital. Glick turns up. She obviously knows about the coordinates and what's going on there. She tells Marion that the pregnant girl is at the same hospital as them. Scans reveal lesions on the girl's brain, similar to the ones on inmates' brains in Mount Massive. They nickname this girl Jane Doe, as they didn't know who on earth she was. Marion notices a tattoo on the girl's chest which references Ezekiel. All of a sudden, she starts babbling and begins fitting. Glick tells Marion to go get the doctor, and while she is gone, she kills the young girl. They leave and Marion has no idea that Glick killed the girl, he just assumes that she died due to a fit. Later that evening, Marion returns home. His daughter is gone and one of her fingers lays on the floor. A message is written on the wall, which states, You work for us now. Glick stayed in Arizona to find the body that Marion left in the desert. It was gone, and a chilling reveal tells us that the body was taken by someone. Over the next week or so, a local reporter named Lynn Langerman and her cameraman and her husband Blake go to the hospital to investigate the death and apparent suicide of the pregnant Jane Doe. Paul Marion was meant to prevent them both from snooping around, but he failed. There's a reason why, but we'll get to it. Because not long after, Lynn and Blake charter a helicopter to fly them out to the Sonoran Desert in Arizona. Blake and Lynn are childhood sweethearts who went to Catholic school St. Sybil together. Blake is on the helicopter and has fallen asleep. He has a dream in which a young girl is calling out his name, and he wakes up. Lynn, his wife, seems pretty peeved as, as Blake was calling out another woman's name in his sleep. He reveals that he was dreaming about a girl called Jessica Gray, a close friend of them both who they haven't thought of or spoken of for years. 
They are filming their intro when all of a sudden the same bright white light and deafening noise which Paul Marion saw downs the helicopter, sending them crashing down into the mountains, miles from anywhere. Blake comes to after being thrown from the helicopter, only to find that Lynn and the pilot are gone. He soon finds the pilot, but he's not really in a talking mood at all. He's been skinned and hung up on a tree. Blake descends into the mountain and sees a clock tower in the distance, indicating that there must be a town there, so he aims to get there to find help. He sees a bunch of armed people near some houses who disappear into the trees and eventually encounters a tall woman who tries to kill him. It appears that both Blake and Lynn are in grave danger. This village appears to be inhabited by some murderous cult. Blake must find Lynn and they need to escape, fast. As he approaches the church, Blake is again stunned by the loud sound and the flash of bright light. And as he approaches the church, he hears a man preaching and he mentions Lynn's name. This man is Sullivan Noth or Papa Noth as he's known to his followers. Let's take a break and look at the cult and how they actually arrived in this place. You see, Noth used to be a shoe salesman in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He was a man who was heavily in debt, was about to lose his house, and one day he turned to a local evangelical radio station which was discussing faith. He heard a preacher on there and found himself disagreeing with the sin regarding extramarital sex and fornication. Before long, Noth would give up the enviable dream of being a shoe salesman and would start preaching himself. He claimed to hear a message hidden in the static of the radio station which told him that God was unhappy with the churches in the world and that God needs a brave new prophet to carry his message. He preached on the streets and, to be fair to him, he had the charisma to drum up numerous followers who would become loyal to him, donating money and possessions. A rich lady called Lydia Dagan allowed the cult to live on her ranch. He came up with a name for his cult and he called it the Testament of the New Ezekiel, with Noth referring to himself as the modern day Ezekiel and wrote the Gospel of Noth. It was at this point that the cult became more fanatical. Noth would encourage the women of the cult to breed regularly and, and Noth of course partook in this himself. Noth decided that he wanted to deliver every child himself too. Trouble was coming though, as due to the excessive home births, the police got wind of this and raided the ranch due to safety concerns. Lo and behold, dead bodies were found on the estate. Many followers were arrested, but what's left of them, including Noth, ended up journeying to hide in the mountains. Noth then took inspiration from Moses and Abraham and climbed to the top of a mountain, naked, because, well, why not? And he claimed to have received a message from God, who told him to slit open his eyeball. As a result, he saw a vision of his future church. Given that they had lost everything, they decided it was time to seclude themselves and build up again from scratch. In 1971, they eventually found somewhere to settle and build their village, but just one problem. The area was inhabited by tribes, namely the Pueblos, Jacarilla, Mescalero and Navajo tribes. They did what any murderous cult would do and fought them off the land, taking it for themselves. The town was named Temple Gate and the purpose of it was for his devoted following of morons to wait there for the end times. The messages Noth hears get more disturbing as time goes on and are essentially the catalyst for the cult being as messed up as it is. These are that the Antichrist will be born out of his own flock, killing children is okay, incest is okay providing the mother of the child is dead and Noth can sleep with whomever he wishes. Followers would get more and more deranged as time went on too, regularly sacrificing their own children to Noth's vision of the Antichrist being birthed. Anyway, jumping back into the story, it isn't long before Blake finds Lynn. She escapes out of an upstairs window of the church and Blake and her reunite, but she complains of stomach pains. Blake hears them talking about Lynn being pregnant, but she denies it. Her and Blake haven't had sex in months, so it can't possibly be true. They continue down a path to try and escape. They are cornered by a couple of cultists, though, who intend to kidnap Lynn again and, I'm assuming, kill Blake. Before they can do that, though, a new group covered in dirt and twigs show up and kill the cultists. One of them sits on Blake to stop him escaping or helping Lynn, and their apparent leader, a person with blonde hair, comes over to him and licks his face. They hit Blake over the head, dizzying him, and they kidnap Lynn and drag her away. What on earth is going on here? Well, it turns out that by one massive stroke of bad luck, Lynn and Blake, well, mainly Lynn, has now become a pawn in a violent and bloody war between two sides, the cultists and the heretics. Let's discuss the heretics briefly, and then we'll jump back in. Led by the unmistakable Val, the heretics are a satanic group at war with Noth's cult. Val was actually a member of the cult, but decided to leave after being consumed with lustful dreams of killing. We find a note from Val's journal where Val feels the dreams are a message, but the message is nothing holy. Val arranged to meet with other cultists who had similar dreams to them. 
These meetings caused the cult of Noth to be split in two, and they went to live in the nearby mines. The members, after living in and around the mines for so long, had basically gone so insane to the point of now being like animals. Covering themselves in mud and sticks and moving around like marsupials, and their language appeared to be broken English. Their main goal was the polar opposite to Noth's, they wanted the Antichrist to be birthed. This was all born out of Val's desire for chaos and destruction, and Val felt that the birth would bring out exactly that. The heretics and the cult, given that they have such differing views, are embroiled in an all-out war. With their assumptions that Lin is pregnant, this gives them their motive for kidnapping Lin. But yeah, let's, uh, let's jump back in. Blake stumbles down the path and, seeing Double, is discovered by a man named Ethan, who takes Blake to his cabin and offers him a place to sleep in order to recharge his energy. Ethan's story is a very sad one. Due to Noth's messed up rule that he got to sleep with anyone he wishes, Ethan's young daughter Anna Lee was one of those poor victims. She fell pregnant and Ethan sent her to leave Temple Gate with someone else, as he knew full well that as she was pregnant, with what Noth believed to be the Antichrist, the Noth would kill her and the baby inside her. Yep, that's right, Ethan's daughter was the Jane Doe that Pauline Glick murdered in the hospital. Blake makes mention of the girl, being that's the reason why they're there in the first place, and Ethan perks up and asks Blake if she is okay. Blake knows that the girl is dead, but he can't bear to break Ethan's heart and lies to him and tells him that she is fine. Blake finally gets some rest. He has a dream. A dream that he's back in high school with Jessica again. He awakens though and he finds Ethan's home being smashed to pieces by the tall woman from before. The woman is demanding to know where Blake is, but Ethan, being the nice man that he is, doesn't give Blake up, but Ethan is killed for his troubles. Blake leaves and pushes on in search of Lynn, but also seems to be mentally unravelling. He comes across another church. Inside, he finds another man named Josiah, who has been strapped to a wheel with his eyes gouged out and the word Judas carved into his chest. Josiah begs Blake to kill him, but Noth and a few of his goons turn up, so Blake hides in the confessional booth. They drag Josiah's wife Mary into the church and torture her, as Noth is looking for Lynn too. Josiah mentions that they took Lynn into the mines. Blake starts his journey into the mines, but is chased into the tall woman's territory. Her name is Marta, and she's not happy. But let's talk about Marta for a second. Marta was kind of an enforcer for the cult, whom all the other cult members were terrified of. It seems from documents in the game that Noth knew Marta while she was growing up, and he potentially groomed her. Other documents show that she felt guilty for killing people, but Noth justified it to her. He told her that even though it was sin in the eyes of God, it basically needed to be done to protect God's plan. Blake eventually manages to escape from her and after a swift boot to the face, he continues on to the mine. Blake's hallucinations start to occur more regularly now, becoming increasingly more disturbing in their nature, and he's being plagued by a creature of some sort, and these visions all seem to feature Jessica, the young girl whom Blake was friends with in high school. We'll get to that a bit later on. He snaps out of it and at some point he can see the mines in the distance. Not far now, all that Blake has to do is cross a narrow beam in order to get there. But the inevitable happens, and it would never be that easy. A swarm of Blake says locusts, but they definitely look more like dragonflies. Well, they swarm Blake, and he falls from the beam into the forest below. Turns out this is probably the worst thing that could have happened, as Blake is now in the territory of the people known as the Scald. A bit of background on the Scald. The Scald were cultists, loyal to Noth, who used to live in Temple Gate themselves, but with all the unprotected sex going on in Temple Gate, sexually transmitted diseases were rife and spread like wildfire. With a lot of the people in the village becoming afflicted with these diseases, anyone who was sick was outcast and sent to live in the mountains, becoming known as the Scald. The definition of the word Scald is being covered in lesions, bumps and sores. Everyone who was outcast has contracted syphilis. But Noth, in his infinite wisdom and connection to the Lord, told his deacon Laird, who was also afflicted, that this affliction was the result of their sins and sent him out to lead the scold. Noth, however, kept in regular contact with Laird. Even though Noth sent Laird out to be with the scold, Noth himself was suffering from the same affliction. The difference is that Noth was allowing himself medication to treat the syphilis, but not allowing that same luxury to his followers. He would regularly send apostles to the store in the nearest town to pick up penicillin to treat him, whilst maintaining the lie that the affliction was a result of sin. His way of controlling them, I guess. He would instead tell his followers that the drugs were merely study aids. Blake comes to and walks towards and through the scold camp and witnesses for himself the level of suffering there. These people are extremely sick. 
Eventually, Blake meets Laird and sat upon his mount, Nick. See, due to the Skull believing a prophecy that they would crucify the Skull Messiah, seeing Blake's video camera and deducing that a modern day Messiah would use a camera instead of a book, they viewed Blake as their Skull Messiah and they do just that, nailing Blake to a cross. Blake gets free, albeit painfully, and runs after Laird, getting his camera back as it's the only evidence he has of his experience at Temple Gate. Poor Blake gets captured again and gets buried alive. Eventually, Blake manages to find a rope in order to descend and escape school territory, but Laird and Nick try to pull Blake's rope up with him on it. Now, the Scald didn't much like Laird and Nick, and a mutiny was rising up within the Scald. They saw their moment and pushed Laird and Nick off the edge, killing them. Blake ends up crossing a lake with a raft, a huge waif engulfs him, but this is all in Blake's head. So I should probably explain the bright lights and loud noises Blake encounters throughout his ordeal. So the first of the bright white lights is the one which took out the chopper carrying Lynn and Blake at the start of the game. Blake encountered this a few times during his journey through Temple Gate and let me explain what this is. You recall that back in Mount Massive, Murkoff were using the morphogenic engine like this. But now it seems they've had an upgrade. They are using a very different method. A different method, but one that is just as effective. By the shore of the lake, we can find a document from a Murkoff employee mentioning a lady named Jennifer Rowland. Jennifer Rowland is a familiar name. She was a member of Murkoff's staff back in Mount Massive. In a document from Outlast, she conveyed a unwillingness to continue carrying out autopsies on inmates at the asylum and requested a transfer. And guess where she ended up? On the document on the shore mentioning Jennifer Rowland, it describes some towers which are visible in the distance and mentions subjects which of course are the citizens of Temple Gate. Now we know that the morphogenic engine's effects left people with scarring on their brains, so the same thing would have been happening here, driving people to the point of literal insanity. The document seems to mention a mysterious feedback loop which somehow makes the signal stronger the closer they got to the site, the site being Temple Gate. It seems that short-term exposure to the signals from the towers were okay, maybe like once or twice, but anything after that, then you're starting to get into dangerous territory. The signals would give the subject hallucinations and delusions dependent on the subject's own psyche. We'll dive more into why and how it affects Blake, and why, in his hallucinations, he keeps ending up back at school. After a tense journey towards the mines, and after being chased by the heretics, Blake makes it to the mines where it appears to be raining blood. Still being hounded and harassed by the heretics, Blake finally gets to an elevator which takes him deep into the mines. He hears Lynn's voice and follows it. He is at one point on his trip through the mines knocked out by Val who stalks him as he journeys deeper into the mines. Eventually Blake gets drugged by the heretics and Val assaults him. Lynn is tied up and is unwillingly taking part in, well, a ritual, let's just leave it there. Blake passes out. He wakes up and sees that the cultists have now invaded the mine and attacked the heretics, probably off the back of what Josiah told them earlier on, that Lynn is in the mines. And remember, in their minds, she is carrying the Antichrist. Blake makes the most of them fighting each other, grabs Lynn and they escape the mines. However, it seems that Lynn is now very pregnant, like about to go into labour pregnant. After walking through a violent storm and making their way through some ruins and witnessing what appears to be the sun burning, they're chased by Marta, who eventually meets her end by being impaled by a cross. How fitting. They find shelter from the storm inside the church and, yep, Lynn is going into labour. She delivers, well, nothing, as it seems, as Blake is literally holding nothing, but sees a baby. And even Lynn goes, there's nothing there, just before she passes away from blood loss. Lynn didn't see anything because she's been deep in the mines, sheltered from the effects of the towers and the morphogenic engine. Blake, on the other hand, hasn't been so lucky. He's really been messed up by the engine, so therefore is seeing something that simply isn't there. How on earth is Lynn pregnant? Lynn was exposed to the engine at the start of the game until the point when she was captured by the heretics and taken into the mines. But to understand why and how she is pregnant, we need to visit the events of Mount Massive again. Remember I mentioned earlier about Richard Traeger and Michelle Haas? that he assaulted her and she fell pregnant, and that he stabbed her and she wasn't even pregnant in the first place. Well, it turns out that the morphogenic engine was causing female employees to inhibit symptoms of phantom pregnancies. Murkoff ended up transferring all of their female workers and all female inmates to other facilities due to this, and that's why there are no females in Mount Massive at all. The same thing happened to poor Lynn. Whilst all this is happening, Noth has set out his plans for his cultists. 
He has led them to believe that the end is coming due to the birth of the Antichrist, that they are too late to stop it, so his followers drink cyanide in a mass suicide. Noth enters the church and sees Blake sat there and of course, because he is affected by the signals from the towers, he sees the baby too and tells Blake to crush the baby under his foot. Noth then kills himself. Blake wanders outside and after walking past all of the dead cultists, he drops to his knees and sees everything before him burning up. And one final bright flash of white light. Blake has seen the end of the world. Well, not quite. Whilst Blake was in the church talking with Noth, the wall rider, remember how it possessed a colony of ants? had arrived and crawled up onto the Murkoff Towers which were emitting the signal, attacking it and destroying them. In one last hurrah, the tower let out a powerful blast and this is the one seen by Blake at the end. So I guess this is a good time to talk about Blake's hallucinations and the delusions that resulted in his exposure to the signals from the tower. As mentioned, Blake seemed to end up back at school for some reason and this is all because of his psyche. He's tormented, haunted and plagued by an incident from his childhood at school. Something terrible happened at school. Now at the start of the game you'll recall that Blake woke up saying another girl's name, Jessica Grey. Now Jessica Grey as we know was a friend of Blake and Lynn and they all attended school together. Jessica liked Blake but Blake didn't really feel the same way about Jessica and instead liked Lynn. One evening after school Blake and Jessica were walking out of school and they were approached by a priest named Father Lautermilch. Now this was a Catholic school, so there were many priests. They were dragged into a nearby classroom and Lautermilch kept Jessica behind, as he was sexually abusing her, and Lautermilch forced Blake to leave. Poor Jessica was terrified and as Blake was walking away, he heard Jessica scream, run off and saw Lautermilch chasing her. Blake chased after Lautermilch and found Jessica on the stairs with a broken neck. Lautermilch had killed her and in the aftermath had forced Blake into keeping his mouth shut, which tormented him for years. Now throughout these hallucinations, as mentioned before, Blake seemed to be stalked by a creature with many limbs and a long tongue. This creature was in fact the embodiment of how he saw Lautermilch, a grotesque monster. We know it's Lautermilch as the creature has the same port wine stain on his face. What's interesting though is that when Blake suffers these hallucinations and records things on his camera whilst suffering these hallucinations, the video is just static, but the audio when played backwards features Lautermilch speaking. You killed her. And I never told a soul. I kept your secret. Wow, the secret. Thank you. Thank you. You never told a soul. You let the small sorrow of her suicide wash over the unacceptable tragedy of her murder. Very creepy indeed. Anyway, after Blake saw the world end, but not really, seven hours later, Pauline Glick and Murkoff employees turn up, but interestingly, there's no Paul Marion. Remember, the last we saw of him, it seemed his daughter had been abducted. I guess you could say that their experiment is now over, given that all the cultists are dead. Pauline Glick is concerned by the fact that someone outside Murkoff has connected the events of Mount Massive Asylum and Temple Gate, and have been feeding information to Paul Marion. Now, we obviously know this to be Simon Peacock. Glick says that it was Paul Marion's job to make sure that Lynn and Blake didn't end up finding Temple Gate, but obviously due to the fact that his daughter is missing and I guess that now Paul Marion is missing, that didn't happen. I wonder who was feeding the information to Lynn and Blake, maybe Simon Peacock or Waylon perhaps. They come across Blake who is completely catatonic. Glick tells the Murkoff team to send him to the nearest facility with forensic psychiatrists and orders them to dig around in his head. Knowing Murkoff, that's not good for Blake at all. Glick gets the news that Paul Marion is indeed missing and says that with what he knows, this makes Paul Marion a very dangerous man indeed. We eventually see that Paul Marion is actually in a hospital bed telling his story to an agent, but we don't know what's gonna happen after that. Now I'm not sure where they'll take out last three. Of course, they've got the Outlast trials coming out likely in 2062 or something like that. But given that that's a prequel which uncovers the origins and the sh very shady backstory of Murkoff, we aren't going to find out what happened to Blake for a very long time. The final part of the Outlast story so far is that in the comic, we see Paul Marion tied up and being asked questions by Simon Peacock. He is asking Paul about the War Rider, and he tells him that they need to find it. All Peacock says is that he himself, after being experimented on, was the first draft, the rough draft of the War Rider. Billy Hope and Miles Upshur, well, that is the masterpiece. He goes on to state that the engine needs a delivery mechanism, a method of infection. And in the case of the asylum, 
It was madness and witnessing enough horror. They would make videos and use them to mould the subject's nightmares, but then they realised that an effective delivery method was religion, praying to gods, a trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>